It is, but uh, this is um, a signal that we have to work even more closely and vigorously together to protect our feminist goals. So I'm glad you all are here to help out. And uh, what I'd like to do um, is we uh, generally start the meeting by having everybody introduce themselves if you have an important announcement of another meeting or something, uh, please do it now. And I'd also like to point out that today is Giving Tuesday. <laughs> and there are two things that I'd like to recommend giving to. First of all, an easy give and a very inexpensive give is a membership in the Clearinghouse on Women's Issues. And for everybody who joins today, and I have some extra copies for people who are already members, if you'd like a hard copy, is our most recent <coughs> newsletter on the Clearinghouse. And it has at the back a uh, membership form. So that's one way you can give in a very easy way and very much appreciated because we'd like your continued help. So um, I can pass these around, but please um, take one if you uh, would like to sign up as a member. And you, and we also welcome organizational members very much. I know. Anyway, you can pass around uh, all of our announcements to anyone, anyway. The second give, which also gives you a gift in return, is I um, am the Education Equity Director. I'm Sue Klein, the co-president of the Clearinghouse and the Education Equity Director at the Feminist Majority Foundation. And Eleanor Smeal, our president, is the publisher of this magazine. You can join the Ms. community. You can even give gifts to lots of feminist friends who need to keep up on the issues uh, through Ms. Um, I'll pass these around, but at the end, um, a copy goes to Jeanette and Emily. Um, and our new Ms. is, from what I heard, in the mail. So <laughs> we'll have two issues, a special election, post-election issue. And the new. And oh no, that's just okay. Let me start with snacks. I was trying to. I also brought the snacks, so I'll interrupt myself to talk about the snacks. I tried to get it down to a science because some of us are at the table and some of us are outliers. Okay, so the outlier has got two uh, plates in the on both sides, and the, and this is for the table, so that you get more than your share. So, but but so pass them around. I'm from Prince George's County and I'm a member of a number of women's organizations. So today I have some flyers for a conference on December 10th. It's called the Women's We Three Women's Empowerment Conference in Prince George's County. And our guest celebrity is Kim Coles, who is a lot of fun. And uh, so I'll pass these around and hope you might be interested in coming.
Uh, I'm Becky Sharvins with the National Women's History Museum. Um, the report has been delivered to Congress, and uh, we shall see what we shall see. I'm Jean Landweber, CWI, form of the word Hi, I'm Eleanor LaCain, and I'm the director of the She Wins, We Win campaign, and um, we're based at the Feminist Majority. I'm Alex Taylor, and I'm from the National Network to End Domestic Violence, and I work on the public policy team. I'm Marion Durrani. I'm also at the National Network to End Domestic Violence. I'm the public policy attorney there. I'm Emily Martin from the National Women's Law Center, and I am Vice President of Workplace Justice and General Counsel there. Jeanette Lim, um, Legal Vice President of the Clearinghouse. And more, more of our members are coming. Hi, I'm Christina Freitas. I'm an intern at the Feminist Majority Foundation. I'm Bailey Holden. I am also an intern at the Feminist Majority Foundation. Hi there. How are you? And I'm Jan Harris, I'm Government Relations Director for National Organization. <coughs> oh, sure. I know there are some real puppies. And I'm Sarah Ann Lewis, Senior Lead Researcher for Policy and Policy. Ooh. <laughs> we like <laughs> you. Can <laughs> 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 you introduce yourself? Um, my name is Roberta Stanley. I am the Vice President for Legislation of the Clearinghouse. I'm from the great state of Michigan, and I'm not responsible for Betsy DeVos. <laughs> go blue. Uh, go green, honey. Go blue. No, go blue. Thank you. Tina and Harriet, would you introduce yourself? Yeah. Harriet Fulbright. And I'm Tina Hobson, and we're sorry we haven't been here, but we've been out of town. And uh, so we just couldn't miss this, so we're glad to see you all and see what we can do to make things difficult. <laughs> <laughs> if anybody's read the, the uh, New York magazine, the New Yorker magazine, <coughs> perfect. I recommend it. Yes. You are here. <coughs> okay, have we introduced everyone who's here? Welcome again, and um, for those of you who came in late, there are plenty of snacks. Please pass them around during the meeting. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our two featured speakers, but for this meeting, we want it to be highly interactive. Oh, a couple more folks are coming. Good. Okay. Um, Welcome. My name is Courtney, <laughs> and I'm an intern. And my name is Prisana. Uh, I'm a public health research and public health fellow. Okay, everybody, welcome. Just the number of seats for you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. A seat at the table there. Okay. And AJ. Okay. 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 And age discrimination. Um, she's particularly focused on helping disadvantaged and at risk children improve their uh, lives by obtaining all of their civil rights, and she's held numerous leadership positions in the uh, U.S. Department of Education's <coughs> Office for Civil Rights, <coughs> including, this is very relevant, she was um, the Acting Assistant Secretary for Civil Rights in two transition periods, so she knows from the inside what's happening in transition and we have a lot to learn from Jeanette. Although I'm sure each transition is different and this one is probably the most different of any. <laughs> okay. Uh, she's uh, litigated uh, desegregation cases in K-12 and, and post-secondary education and uh, those of you, the younger ones may not have heard of this, but she was the special assistant to the president. Uh, no, she represented the U.S. in obtaining the admission of women to the University of the Citadel in South Carolina. The Citadel, of course, had been an all-male military school. Can you hear me? No, no, no. no. 
Sorry, I'm going to stand up. Is that better? Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. Jeanette was the special assistant to the president of Westchester State University of Pennsylvania in 1976 to 1979. I actually got to know Jeanette when I was also working in the U.S. Department of Education, and Jeanette was in charge of program legal, which was the policy program for the whole Office for Civil Rights. Um, in her more recent years in the U.S. Department of Education before she retired, she was the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Management and Planning in the Office of Elementary and Secondary Education. And she's the daughter of Chinese immigrants and has had firsthand family experience with how educational attainment can provide an avenue for improving people's future. She is a Juris Doctor from Temple University Law School, a master's degree, listen to this, you would never guess it, in medical genetics from the University of Wisconsin Medical School, Madison, and a Bachelor of Science degree in chemistry from the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. Uh, Jeanette suggested we also um, uh, let me introduce my friend, Emily Martin, who I actually met before she uh, joined the National Women's uh, Law Center. I met Emily when she was working for ACLU. As Emily already mentioned, she is the General Counsel and Vice President for Workplace Justice at the National Women's Law Center and um, works on efforts to ensure fair treatment and advocacy, policy and education efforts um, for women at work and uh, focuses on achieving workplace standards. She also provides in-house legal counsel and representation to the center. Prior to joining the center, she was deputy director of the Women's Rights Project at the American Civil Liberties Union, ACLU, where she spearheaded litigation, policy, and public education initiatives to advance the rights of women and girls to fair treatment and work at school and in housing. She was a law clerk for senior judge uh, Wilfred Feinberg of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit and for Judge T.S. Ellis of the Eastern District of Virginia and previously worked for the Center, uh, that's the National Women's Law Center, as a recipient of the Women's Law and Public Policy Fellowship. She has um, served as the Vice President and President of the Fair Housing Justice Center, a nonprofit in New York City, and she is a graduate of the University of Virginia and Yale Law School. Welcome! And she has two children who live on Capitol Hill. That's true. So, delighted to have you both, Jeanette, and delighted to turn the meeting over to you. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you everybody for coming. Uh, this is an important transition period and the purpose of discussing transition today um, is to identify our opportunities to save the gains we have made and to protect against the erosion of the rights of women and minorities. Uh, if you can't hear me, let me know and I will speak up. I'm going to read from my notes because there's a lot of important detailed information I don't want to overlook. <clears throat> the opportunities that we have today exist in the period before inauguration, right now, and include support, supporting current agency efforts to stabilize gains. Also, there will be or has been burrowing in of political staff um, and we need to identify official jobs that are listed in what is called the Plum Book. 
After the inauguration of the president-elect, there will be opportunities to affect appointments through the whole continuing nomination and confirmation processes. During my 36 years in the federal government, I worked through nine transitions, five of it which were elections resulting in changes in leadership, and four of which were transitions with the re-election of incumbent presidents. They were all transitions. For 23 of those years, I held senior executive service positions and served as interim assistant secretary in the Office for Civil Rights in the Department of Education. Currently, we are in this period before inauguration, and you will note that some agencies and the administration are um, likely to promulgate regulations, policies that um, would want to stabilize existing gains. So these regulations particularly would benefit from our support in making comments and suggestions for adding feminist issues. The, um, I personally know how important this period is, and I can share a very personal experience in that regard. After graduating from law school, I started working in the federal government in 1979 in uh, the Health, Education, and Welfare General Council. I was assigned to a team of four women attorneys to develop an intercollegiate athletics policy to investigate several pending complaints that OCR had. In December of 1979, as HEW, we published in final the Title IX Intercollegiate Athletic Policy. In May of 1980, Education and HHS was formed out of the predecessor HEW. And in November um, 1980, Ronald Reagan won the presidential election. During 1980, after Ed was created and before Reagan's inauguration, OCR was intent on applying the 1979 athletic policy and issuing letters of findings to establish precedents and stabilize the new policy. We needed to conduct investigations of these long-standing and pending complaints of sex discrimination in athletic programs at universities, including the University of Michigan, the University of Hawaii, Kansas, Syracuse, and Akron, among many <coughs> others. The investigations of these previously filed complaints were waiting for a policy on the highly controversial college athletics. To apply that policy, we in headquarters, OCR, worked with our regional offices to form investigative teams. And that is how I met my husband. Who turned out to have knowledge of the NCAA as a former basketball player? He's six foot five. <laughs> His and other male investigators' experiences turned out to be invaluable, as we women attorneys had little or no athletic experience. Um, in 1980, there were no NCAA women teams. And the AAIW, Association of Intercollegiate Athletics for Women, supported some programs across the country, but most were run like club sports. <coughs> I actually kind of like them. They always had tea after them. <laughs> but that's another thing. Um, the investigative teams worked overtime during this period including over the Christmas holidays to complete investigations and issue letters of findings, which we did, and the rest is Title IX history. We were able to establish the intercollegiate athletic policy under the leadership of Judge Shirley Huffstetler, who was the first Secretary of Education, appoint, appointed for a very short tenure, tenure by President Jimmy Carter. Burrowing in. This is a name given to the process of political appointees successfully obtaining 
a career position before the end of the administration. These conversions must follow the personnel practices of Title V of the United States Code and receive increased oversight and scrutiny by OPM and GAO, especially during transition years. Presently, one can speculate that there were fewer burrowing in conversions due to expectations that a Hillary victory would continue most of the practices of the Obama administration. Um, with regard to confirmations, Article 2, Section 2 of the Constitution provides that the President shall nominate and the Senate shall advise and consent in order for certain appointments to be confirmed. Those certain appointments can be identified in the Plum Book, which is published every four years during election years. The House and the Senate alternate in compiling the list of jobs to be filled by department, the type of appointment, the current incumbent, and the salary levels. There are 1,600 presidential appointments, 1,200 of which require Senate confirmation. Of the 1,200 requiring confirmation, there are, six, there are secretaries of 15 cabinet agencies deputy secretaries, undersecretaries, assistant secretaries, and general counsels, amounting to over 350 positions. The numbers of Supreme Court, appellate, and district court justices to be filled, which will have extraordinary and lasting effect, are unknown. Director positions in regulatory agencies like the EPA and the Federal Aviation Administration will amount to over 130 positions. U.S. attorneys and U.S. marshals, about 200. Certain positions in independent agencies like NASA and the National Science Foundation will amount to over 120. Ambassadors to foreign nations, over 150. And full and part-time members of commissions and boards, over 160. That's a lot of nominations, a lot of appointments that are important. The um, appointments, in my experience, during the 1980 to 81 by President Ronald Reagan during the transition from Jimmy Carter are very similar to the current Trump appointments. <laughs> For the first time in modern political history, President Reagan in 1980 to 81 appointed leaders of agencies hostile to the work of their agencies. For example, I see some nods. James Watt was appointed to head the Interior Department. Announced, he announced the goal to open up for use <coughs> protected natural resources and remove government oversight. Similarly, President-elect Trump has nominated Martin Ebal, a non-believer of climate change, to head the EPA and to lead a major assault on environmental regulations. <coughs> Currently, the nominations <coughs> of agency heads, <coughs> judges, and policy advisors can provide us all an opportunity to communicate to senators reasons to vote to not confirm. Careful vetting of nominees' backgrounds can unearth disqualifying information. President Reagan appointed Terrell Bell to be Secretary of Education after Secretary Huffstetler by Carter with a goal to eliminate the department. However, teachers, their associations, their unions, and other organizations may know their support for the department to through influential individuals and saved the department. By the way, Reagan also appointed Clarence Thomas as his first OCR assistant secretary. I worked under him. And Anita Hill was his ad attorney advisor, but that's a different topic. <laughs> President-elect Trump has nominated Betsy DeVos. Devos. 
Duvas. Thank you. To be Secretary of Education, who is a choice by school vouchers advocate and anti-public schools. She and her husband have been anti-Title IX through donations such as a $50 million donation to Grove City College, well known for its refusal to accept federal funds in order to avoid complying with Title IX. Nannygate, some of you might remember, refers to the 1993 episodes that derailed two of President Clinton's choices for Attorney General. Nomin um, nominee corporate lawyer Zoe Baird was found to have employed two illegal aliens as nanny and chauffeur and her nomination was had to be withdrawn. Then federal judge Kimba Wood was nominated, but she too was found to have hired an illegal alien to care for her child and her nomination was also withdrawn. Finally, President Clinton was successful in appointing Janet Reno to the post of U.S. Attorney General. I had the honor of working for Janet Reno in the Civil Rights Division um, of Justice. She had been the State Attorney General of Florida, knew the importance of career staff, upon whom she relied and treated with respect. In return, she became one of the most admired, respected, and beloved Attorney General by all of us at Justice. The Robert Bork nomination by President Reagan in 1987 had a lasting impression on the confirmation process. Bork's writings revealed his opposition to the concept of one person, one vote. He wrote against the 1964 Civil Rights Act requirement that hotels, restaurants, and other businesses had to serve people of all races. He was against school desegregation, women's choice, and evolution theory. <laughs> he did not refute or soften any of these positions, on con these controversial positions during confirmation hearings. Minority and women groups made known their strong opposition to his confirmation and their concern that he would roll back the civil rights gains of the Berger and the Warren courts. He failed to receive the needed Senate votes to affirm his nomination, 58 to 48, and a new verb, to bort or to be bort, was born. Defined by the Oxford English Dictionary as, quote, to defame or vilify a person systematically, close quote. The confirmation process was changed forever by this, so that nominees today are so circumspect in their responses during confirmation hearings that one fails to learn what they really think and are left to rely on previous statements and their writings making it very difficult to discern what they will be doing in the future. Another well-known Reagan appointee was David Stockman to head the OMB, <coughs> where he applied supply-side and trickle-down budget um, theories with questionable results. For example, at the end of the Carter administration, the deficit was $79 billion. After one year of Stockman's Reaganomics, the deficit was one trillion dollars. And after four and a half years, when Stockman resigned, the deficit was 1.8 trillion. Reagan also appointed Edwin Meese as Attorney General and William Bradford Reynolds as Assistant AG to head the Civil Rights Division. Reynolds was an anti-civil rights. I hope this information provides incentive for all of us, for all of you to learn more about confirmation, to vet and research current nominees with all these important positions and to use research and information to influence decision makers in Congress. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, 
as you've heard, I'm Emily Martin from the National Women's Law Center, and I was asked to talk a little bit about um, what the National Women's Law Center and the women's community more broadly is focusing on during transition and what our work looks like in, at this moment. Um, so, so one of the things that we are doing um, at, back in August or September or so, a large group of women's organizations and organizations that are committed to women's equality came together to start to talk about uh, the presidential transition and about goals and asks. Um, that conversation started with a different set of assumptions than where we are today. But um, the conversation continues, and one of the things that um, that large group of organizations is doing is working on a um, relatively short document, sending out key principles and um, policy goals from the women's community broadly that will be communicated to the transition team. Um, and that's still being drafted, so it's hard to say exactly what it looks like at this moment, but I, the, the goal is for it to be a place for a broad variety of organizations to affirm the importance of um, key principles relating to uh, both issues such as respect, diversity, tolerance, um, equal opportunity, and also key areas where it is important to protect gains and continue to make progress. So employment opportunity, educational opportunity, um, greater equity in the criminal justice system, uh, fair treatment of immigrants. Um, so that process has been a useful way of um, coordinating and sharing um, messages, goals, and priorities through the transition. Um, more broadly, one of the things that we and others are doing, following from what Tina just said, is working with the Obama administration in these final weeks and months to get final rules, final decisions out the door. Um, so, for example, there is uh, a part of the Affordable Care Act called Section 1557 that prohibits um, sex discrimination and other forms of discrimination in federally funded health programs and activities. And the regulations um, interpreting that protection were issued in May. Um, one of the things that we are urging uh, HHS to do before the close of this administration is to issue decisions on various complaints that we at the National Women's Law Center have filed um, with the Office of Civil Rights in HHS. Um, we have a set of complaints regarding um, health insurance programs that deny maternity coverage for dependents. So um, maternity coverage is available for the employees in these employer-provided okay. health, health insurance programs, but not for the children of the employees. And you know, these days, children can remain on their parents' insurance until the age of 26. So it's quite, it is not, uh, unusual for people who are up to age 26 to have babies themselves. So we have a set of complaints saying that the failure to provide maternity coverage for dependents is sex discrimination and violation of Section 1557. We also have a set of complaints um, challenging gender rating, charging women more than men for long-term care insurance in various states. Um, so what we hope is that this uh, administration will, in addition to the regulations and to the defense of those regulations in court, there's an ongoing court battle about some of the details of those regulations, uh, will use this moment to issue some decisions clearly applying and implementing these rules. So that's an example of some of the progress that we are seeking to solidify and protect in these final weeks. We're also thinking about how and where uh, there really still remain possibilities for progress. So, so in the campaign, uh, Donald Trump showed some interest in child care policy and paid maternity leave. He's the first Republican presidential nominee to come forward with a paid maternity leave plan. Um, we have a lot of quibbles with the details, but still there is some something to talk about. There is uh, some we. 
really plan to do a lot of work uh, to <coughs> make the case for investments in child care and to work with our partners as they do the same around paid leave to build on that express openness and interest um, and to set out the the progressive vision and make the case for why if you want to ensure that child care is affordable and available as president to be trump said he did on the campaign trail that that means um, not just providing some tax deductions for higher income families but it also means really funding child care for lower income families who need that help the most. Um, so doing that, strategizing and thinking about how and where to make the positive case is definitely something that we and others are very much engaged in right now. Similarly, um, on the campaign trail, uh, Donald Trump expressed some interest in increasing the minimum wage. So a uh, <coughs> coalition of groups, including women's groups who uh, focus on that issue, are thinking and strategizing about the best ways to position a minimum wage fight in, this con in the current context. Um, and more broadly, to uh, ensure that the populist positioning of this administration is really leveraged to make the strongest case for policies that will really address the economic needs of working people. So some of the work that's going on right now is, is thinking about planning to messaging around how to make that case that if you care about the working class, if you care about the working people, the people who um, help, uh, helped elect Donald Trump, that here are the set of policies that really address their economic concerns and needs and articulating a strong economic message. Um, we also are gearing up to pick fights and draw contrasts um, and using the full variety of tools in our toolbox to do that. So that means grassroots outreach and public education and mobilization. Um, Trump's win has mobilized and energized progressives who are eager to organize and speak out. There's a lot of appetite for, um, <laughs> for calling your congressman, for showing up, for making the case, for yelling about uh, these issues. And we and others are working to try to, um, to ensure that that energy is put to good use. Um, and some victories are possible even in challenging political environments. Um, the Republican margins in Congress are narrower than last Congress, which means that picking off just a couple Republicans through public outcry can make a big difference. Um, so for example, what that means in the immediate term is doing the work that Jenna talked about, digging into the backgrounds of nominees and appointees. and telling the troubling stories of their positions and what it means for women um, is work that we are doing and will be continuing to do. And you know, we're not going to block every troubling nominee by a long shot, but there are examples of nominees who have been sunk by a convergence of factors, including their uh, controversial statements in the past. For example, Linda Chavez, who was uh, nominated as Secretary of Labor by uh, George W. Bush, and who, uh, who generated a lot of outcry from progressive groups, and who had her own uh, illegal immigrant employment problem, and that combination of factors led to her withdrawing her nomination. So that sort of work, being able to take advantage of opportunities, being prepared to make the case, is um, definitely part of our transition work right now. And then we're also planning and preparing for the work that we will do going forward. I recently had uh, drinks with a friend who uh, works in the Department of Labor and who hopefully reminded me from her position as someone on the inside 
that even a little outside advocacy can make a surprisingly big difference. That pushing back on regulations, on guidance, on all the pieces that make federal agencies go can have an impact because whether or not in the long run there is a victory, that pushback slows the work, it creates process, it creates distraction, it creates friction and generates other paths of least resistance. It makes it harder to get everything done if each thing is a harder thing. And our job in many instances will be to ensure that there is a cost to, um, to rolling back progressive policies, that there is a cost to failing to act on the policies that matter for women and families. Um, so through all the techniques that we use, like you know everything on co from comments on proposed regulations to petitions and public calls for action to reports on important work that's being undone or important work that's not being done, all of those levers for interacting with federal agencies. Um, so right now, at this moment, what we're doing is identifying what we think the likely targets will be in a Trump administration, what policies we think will be uh, the targets for rollbacks, and um, first of all, identifying them so we are watching to see what happens, and sometimes things happen quietly, things are taken off websites and pulled back, and so part of our job right now is to be watching so that <coughs> those quiet rollbacks don't happen quietly. So again, those things come with a cost. And frankly, the past uh, several years has been useful in demonstrating a lot of obstructive techniques from the outside. So there's been a lot of fighting, um, pushing back against the Obama administration's efforts. And many of those techniques can be used on our side as well, everything from Freedom of Information <coughs> Act requests, which may or may not get you a lot of valuable information. Sometimes it does, but again, regardless, there is a response required. It takes work. It takes um, it, it. It takes energy within agencies to look for the documents you're seeking to make a determination whether or not you can get them. Um, that can be useful. Uh, we've seen in the Obama administration the power of litigation in hand-picked friendly courts brought by. Uh, conservative state attorney generals challenging regulations. So over the past six months, there have been a ton of uh, nationwide injunctions against Obama rules coming out of federal district courts in Texas. That is a strategy which is available to progressives as well, to pick friendly district courts, friendly circuits, to partner with progressive attorney generals to bring legal challenges to um, rules or to agency actions that, um, that violate either uh, federal legal protections or constitutional protections, and to have the fight. And even when those legal challenges don't ultimately result in a legal victory, there can be real benefits both in terms of telling a story, to communicating to the public about why the fight is worthwhile, what principles are at stake, and in engaging and demonstrating, again, that there is a cost in terms of uh, spent energy and spent credibility and spent political capital in um, rolling back good regulations and issuing bad ones. Um, so those are some of the strategies that we are gearing up for and planning and thinking about um, as we re-envision what our work looks like over the next year or two, or three or four. Change is good in some respects, but maybe not in this one. <laughs> yeah. So it would be great to hear others' thoughts and questions um, about where we go from here. Well, Emily, uh, maybe this is something that I made yet, but are we planning on distributing the transition agenda to our friends in Congress? Probably not for anyone. 
So I believe the current vision, and again, it's all a little unclear because the document is only, it, it isn't written yet, it's a draft. Um, so these decisions are definitely tentative, but I believe the current vision is that that document is a public document, that that document is um, at least as much for the outside world, for the broader community, for our friends, as for the transition team and setting out here is where the women's community stands, here's where we'll fight, here's what we believe in. <coughs> there is precedent for them withdrawing candidates. They're so opposed to civil rights issues and their inherent beliefs. There's a woman from the Heritage Foundation who was nominated to be Assistant Secretary of the Department of Ed for legislation. And in the Q&A before the committee for confirmation, she said that um, families who had children with special needs were being punished for their sins. Um, so they withdrew her nomination. So one of the good things to do when you, you deal with people on the Hill is to give them very astute questions to pose to the nominees because some of these are so far afield. Yeah. You right. delve into issues that all of us care so deeply about. These people are neither well versed, they don't care, and they don't have a base. And so they can be embarrassed. And we're blessed, like on the Senate Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee, we have Tammy Baldwin, we have Elizabeth Warren, we have Bob Casey, we have Bernie Sanders, we have Patty Murray. And um, who better than to pose questions um, that we might be able to supply them? Not that they couldn't come up with their own, oh, and Al Franken, that they couldn't come up with their own questions, but sometimes it doesn't occur to people. Who would have ever thought that a nominee would, would think that about special ed? Mm -hmm. yeah. And your point about their being so naive and un, <laughs> just un, they, you're right, unskilled, they're not, they haven't they been come from a totally different people. venue than exactly. in this room. And they'll just say something. Mm -hmm. I'm interested in organizing because I'm going to so many meetings of people, of, of all groups, my congregation being one tonight, to say where are we and where are we going. And I, I heard, and I just want to check this out, that you had a meeting before, well before the election. Was that, was that unprecedented? So the women, so as I said, a, a, a large number of women's organizations and organizations that um, are committed to women's issues came together for a couple meetings um, before the election, which isn't unprecedented. Um, it was an attempt to be a little bit organized and, um, and to have some coherent set of ask some principles um, for the new administration. So frankly, much of that conversation in August and September was putting together our wish list of all the things that we hoped that a uh, Hillary Clinton administration might do. Um, and honestly, we didn't spend a lot of time thinking about uh, Plan B. But when Plan B happened, there was this, this group that had already come together to have the very conversation, which which is good. Um, so at, at least in that way, we were prepared to come back together to talk about, all right, so this document we've been working on doesn't seem to make a lot of sense in the current context. So what does it make sense for us to do? Where do we go from here? Uh, hi, I really enjoyed the talk. Um, with regard to work, that's something that really concerns me, and I serve on several government bodies and organizations interested in these things. Once upon a time, we had a national consumer cooperative bank. I wonder if that died, and I wonder if that legislation still exists. This was years ago. And I also wonder if this isn't a good time for groups interested in cooperatives as a form of organization, as a form of consumer protection, might talk more about this. There are interesting economic alternative approaches, and these need to be aired. I, I support what you're doing, but I think we really need to get the various players in these conversations to think about alternative structures. And of course, the word that wasn't uttered yet was unions, and how we 
can work with them and what you, for example, can do uh, in that regard as well? Yeah, well, I, I would love to hear more about that work because that is an area where I personally have not been involved, but more broadly in thinking about um, and thinking about the need for the progressive community to come together around a compelling economic vision and agenda, which is definitely a set of conversations that, ha that is happening with unions um, as we think the what is the alternative vision to put forward and how do we best ready ourselves for defense against the attacks that we know are coming. I really agree with you that it is a moment for um, building a broad coalition and maybe thinking a little bit more creatively about what it is that we are offering up as the alternative. Um, and in addition to the conversations between this group of women's organizations that have come together around transition, there are definitely broader efforts within the progressive community to um, try to better coordinate around messaging and strategies and goals to increase uh, the communications uh, among different segments of the community so that hopefully there are more united voices and efforts um, in the fights ahead in Congress and with the administration. Tina? I think you said something very important because I don't think it's even just the progressive community that's interested. I think it's a broader community. Mm -hmm. And with your permission, I'd like to tell you a story. When the, when the, uh, we were disappointed when the election, of course, didn't work out as we had hoped. And I went across the street. I live at Thomas Circle, and I went across the street to the hotel to have lunch. I didn't want to talk to anybody, <laughs> and, and neither did anybody else. <laughs> so, so therefore, I sat down at the table and ordered my lunch. And the uh, waitress came up. And she was Latina, or Latino. And then uh, one of the other people who was working came up, and she was African American. And then the hostess came up, and she was white. And we sat there and we talked about how we were all disappointed. And uh, and we talked for quite a while. I mean, you know, considering that, that everybody had jobs. And I was really. They finally said, "We're all together, aren't we?" And I said, yes, indeed, and so forth. And then I went to pay my bill, and as usual, I had left my wallet in the apartment. <laughs> so, so I said, I will go across and get my wallet, and I'll come back and pay you. So I went out on the circle, and one of those women rushed out and said, we don't want you to pay us, that this matters so much to us. And so we'd like to give this to you as a gift. This wow. much. Now, there are all those people out there. So my experience, and I, I agree with you, I was at the Department of Energy when it was started, and I, I know what you're talking about. But I, I think it's very important that we support January 21, the Women's March, to right. show that we're all together in this. And we, um, I have a son in Berkeley, and in uh, I mean, in, uh, not Berkeley, in uh, uh, what's next to uh, New York City? Uh, Brooklyn. Brooklyn. Okay. In Brooklyn, and do you know that they're going to start buses from the Ber from the Berkeley Center at four in the morning to bring women down here? And I think that, like a Martin Luther King, uh, not even a march, just a gathering of women like that, just to show mm -hmm. that we're all together and that other women can see we're all together so they don't feel it. it's just progressives or something else. I think it's very important to participate in that on the 21st. So I would like to suggest that I will pull together and any of you who are involved in <coughs> this can talk to me afterwards. And, and Harriet and I would like to pull together something that uh, you can just put out on your computer just to remind people to participate in that movement because it shows we are together and it shows 
there are a lot of people, and I hope it isn't 20 degrees, but you know, <laughs> never know. But I think it's a very important first step. Yeah. Then I'm so glad to hear that you guys are taking the next steps, that you have them in mind already, because I think it's going to be harder than we think. So that therefore, uh, if anyone has anything to do with the, um, the 21st, um, I'd like you to talk to me afterwards, and then I'll give, uh, 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 I'll, I'll provide some information that's accurate, hopefully, and truthful, although that doesn't appear to matter anymore. <laughs> <laughs> we already know three, probably more than I haven't read the papers this morning, appointments that we should really look carefully at and see how we can lobby and uh, send information. There's Betsy DeVos. The DeVos. DeVos. <laughs> I, I, I don't blame you for wanting to mispronounce it, but they give her credit for doing a whole lot more than she has. She did not design She's not the an educator. in Detroit. She's not even an educator. No, she's, no, she's never attended a public school. This is nor are her children. This is the Amway DeVos. Yeah, this right. is the Amway. Right. And, you know, Blackwater. she doesn't even buy her. Blackwater. Her brother is oh, yeah, Blackwater. Blackwater. Yeah. So this family. Anyway. I hate Prince. Sue, I have a question for the lady who just spoke about. Let's finish, the, finish, the, finish the list. list. And then hang on. The second one we know yeah. about is Price. Yeah. And I'm yeah. really worried. He he was the architect of some of the legislation that Congress was considering to derail the Affordable Care Act. Yeah. And then the third is EBA, the um, um, EPA, um, who is doesn't believe in climate change. Is um, anyway, Jeff Sessions. Jeff Sessions. Jeff Sessions. Jeff Sessions. Chris oh Chris Chris yes, mm -hmm. AG. What? I, well, I, I just had, um, we've been trying to establish uh, from now, um, since we hear from a lot of our folks planning on coming down, whether, the, and I don't know if you know this, we have trouble getting a hold of the organizers, whether they've actually gotten a permit. That's exactly what I was going to suggest. We've heard they, they have not. Because if they haven't. And whether there will be porta potties and whether there will be many hotel rooms available right. because of the inauguration. Just You're talking about the and finally, the worst yeah, thing we've yes. heard yeah. is that the KKK yeah. has yeah. asked for a rally yeah. permit yeah. on that same day. I oh, oh, I'm just going to go. Yeah. The day after. But that's just a rumor. And I have not confirmed it. So well, I we just have a lot of questions. Total rumor. But I was at a meeting yesterday where someone said they heard a permit was obtained. But yes. I have no idea whether that's founded or not. For, for this group. For this, for this okay. March. And it will okay. be on uh, where Martin Luther King was at the Lincoln Memorial. I mean, that's where it's going to be. And I understand, like you, that they have okay. a command. And they're bringing in, they're working. I, I'm going to try to get the details of all of us so that I can write it out on one page, you know, for those of us, because some of us are, are inviting people to stay in our rooms right. at right. Thomas Circle, right. so that uh, we're, we feel that this is the first big effort that we can make, and men want to come. They're going to wear wigs. <laughs> <laughs> so they may come anyway because they're so interested. So we'll see. But if they're starting bus service from Brooklyn at three in the morning, they've got it organized because they're good at it. So I'll find out details and who's going to speak and so forth, and I'll get back with you. And maybe we can just put something out to all the members that this is step one. I think Al Sharpton has got a, a group before the inauguration. And there are there will be demonstrations on inauguration day. I know Anti Coalition has.